the, um, the last thing I want to talk about is, is thinking beyond this weekend. So after you've started this great company that, uh, that all of you are going to get together and brainstorm and come up with and, and generate some incredible product or incredible service, the next part is actually building out the team. And, and I know you're probably not thinking about it at this point, but it, it's important to think about. Um, hiring and managing and mentoring great people. And there's a few things I've learned. This turns out to be one of the most critical things that you can do in, in any business or any, any enterprise. Um, at a, in India, we, we ended up having an entrance exam for our uh, new employees that we found out that was actually tougher than the most elite college entrance exams. It had a, a lower pass rate than it was to, uh, to get into the IITs, which are the leading technical institutes in, uh, in India. Um, we were looking for people with top grades. People were used to coming into businesses and having an offer within 24 hours in one interview, and we were making them wait weeks and having them go through these like, batteries of six and seven interviews, and then uh, going through this like, centralized hiring committee uh, that was in, in California. I mean, we imposed a lot of hurdles and only ensured that we took the very best people. You know, the reason we did this was, uh, even though there was a huge, extraordinary amount of pressure on me to hire as quickly as possible, but the reason we did this is we have a belief at Google that a players hire A players, but B players hire C players, and C players hire D players. And as soon as like the, the B and C and D players come in, the, the drop in the company is pretty precipitous. It, it goes down off a cliff. Um, but when you when you got a group of A players, when, when you've got a group of like committed entrepreneurs, and you've got a group of people who really care about the business, they're always interested in getting people in who are a little bit better. When I hired my successor in India, I, tried, I wanted to find someone whom I would want to work for. Um, and for. Not just someone who I'd want to work for, but someone I would quit on the spot and start working for them immediately. And it took a long time to, to find that person. Not that the bar was necessarily very high, but we wanted to make sure we had the right person both in culture and experience. And, and like I found someone who guaranteed, like the first week he joined, I'm doing turnover with him and he's telling me things about the business I should have known two years ago. That's the, the level of hiring that, that you need to have within a company. One other thing that Google does in terms of hiring is we have a centralized hiring model. Even today, every single offer we make at Google is signed off on by, uh, by Larry Page and by our, uh, by our senior executives. Whether it's a facilities person in Tokyo, an AdWords coordinator in uh, Hyderabad or Gurgaon, India, uh, or a CFO that we hired a couple weeks ago, every single candidate is signed off on by Larry Page. And he will actually go through and say, this candidate doesn't meet the bar. This candidate isn't better than the candidates we hired a month ago. This candidate isn't generalized enough to be able to do all the things we want to do in the future. Uh, that is an incredibly powerful discipline because it, it not only encourages us to, uh, to, to continue raising the bar all the time, it makes sure that we hire people who can do a variety of interesting things within our company. And I encourage you to do the same thing. The worst thing that you can do is have the salespeople hire salespeople, the engineers hire engineers, the facilities people hire facilities people uh, because that is a, a guaranteed, guaranteed path to getting completely over-specialized people who can't contribute as the company grows. And then once you hire these fantastic people that you're going to find, because Cincinnati is full of fantastic people, um, give them the freedom to, to do what they do best. One great, I'm sure all of you have heard of 20% time, which is the thing at Google we've given engineers one day a week to do whatever they want. Uh, Google News came out of this. Gmail actually ended up coming out of this. There, there's another kind of secret at Google, which is that innovation comes from all over our organization. And I actually heard a, a fantastic story about this last week. Um, which is um, stock options. So a lot of companies in Silicon Valley, a lot of entrepreneurial companies give stock options. And a stock option just means, for those of you who, who, don't, who may not know, it's you have a contract to buy stock, like in, say, a year later. Uh, the contract says you can buy it at $100 a share, for example. And if the stock goes up to like $150 a share, that's great, because you buy it for $100, you sell it for $150, the government takes out a bunch of taxes, and you get the difference. That's a really good deal. Um, it's not a good deal the other way. Uh, because if you buy the stock at 100 and it goes down to 50, then you, know, you get zilch. You don't have to pay taxes, but we, thank goodness, but you, you, uh, you, you get nothing. So there's this HR manager at, at Google who is actually sitting at lunch one day near a table full of accountants and finance people. Um, and, he, and he said, hey, I've got a question for you guys about how we you know, measure things in, in our income statement. I've noticed that we always had this huge stock option charge um, that it's just an accounting charge. It's not money we pay anybody. It was just this accounting charge. And, and why do we have that? And they began to explain in great detail, FASB and all this other stuff. And he said, why don't we like, take, take advantage of that and actually you know, give the value of stock options? Because each one of those contracts you give out, each one of those stock option contracts actually has an intrinsic value. 
um, you can actually sell it. There's a whole stock op there's whole option exchange that uh, where you can buy and sell options on pretty much everything. Um, and they said, well, there's all these reasons why you can and can't. They're employee stock options, yada yada yada. So so these so this this HR manager and a couple of accountants they went to some lawyers. They started talking to people in the SEC. Then they started talking to our executives. And then we started this program called the TSO program, Transferable Stock Options, where suddenly you could sell your stock options instead of exercise them. The net effect of this is every single person's stock options in Google became 10 to 20% more valuable overnight. It was astounding. Um, and this is from an HR manager and accountant. These are not like the hotbeds of innovation at most companies. Imagine if like the HR manager's manager said, you know, you should really focus on our, um, you know, uh, our, our compensation policy. Or if the accountant said, shouldn't you be working on some Sarbanes-Oxley stuff? No, I mean, their manager said, yeah, that sounds like fun. Why don't you go do it and see what you come up with? Um, and they worked and what they did is they, they created incredible value for every employee at Google um, with actually no cost to us as a company. And now it's a model that other companies can use. In fact, we're trying to teach other companies how to do this uh, so that other companies can derive value from it. That is innovation. So innovation doesn't necessarily come from engineering. It doesn't necessarily come from your product managers. It doesn't come from any one center in the company, but it can come from anywhere if you have the culture in place where you embrace and enjoy engineering. So three things, you know, really having a, a large vision and breaking it down for, uh, for, your, for your people, uh, taking and embracing risk and really enjoying it, um, and then finally, you know, extending the model with hiring and, and training the next generation. I'll, I'll leave you with one other point. It's something I just thought of uh, from the, um, this manager's conference we had. We had this professor from uh, the Wharton School of Business come in. Uh, this guy's name is Mike Usim, and he's the, the head of the leadership department at Wharton. He was an incredibly compelling speaker, and he spoke for like an hour straight, and everyone was just glued, you know, to the edge of the, was on the edge of their seat. It just different examples he had of leadership and, and uh, uh, different stories and narratives. But one thing I thought was really interesting was that he said, when you look at the most successful leaders in, in business, uh, in government, in academia, and, and they actually did research around this, and they, they, they began to ask them like, where they got their leadership knowledge, where they got their leadership skill, they actually de devolved it down to a formula. 10% they figured out came from their, their book learning and, and the skills they got in formal courses. You know, the, some of them had MBAs, some of them had business degrees, you know, on the job training, that sort of thing. They said 20% came from formal mentorship, or formal inter formal mentorship, you know, learning from their boss, learning from some sort of mentor in the company in which they operated. Does that sound right to you? So the, the mentorship is about twice as valuable as the, the book learning? I think, like, I heard that and I said, yeah, that resonates with me, that sounds about right. The other 70% if the most successful leaders they saw, the people who just, like, had a completely out, uh, outstanding results, the other 70% came from situations they had been in where they'd gotten in over their head. Jobs they had where they didn't have a formal checklist and they went in, where they actually just had to go in and figure out the checklist on their own. Um, positions and roles where they really didn't know exactly what to do and had to figure it out with a significant amount of risk. And, and what he concluded was that the, the great thing about new ventures and the great thing about entrepreneurship is you can manufacture these situations where you end up over your head yourself. That's what starting a new venture is all about. And all of you this weekend are going to have an opportunity to, to create a venture which is, puts you in over your head. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity for growth. It's, a, uh, it's an incredible opportunity, I think, to develop as a person. It's one of the most exciting things that you can do. So I'm, uh, I'm jealous of you. I, uh, I wish you good luck. And I uh, greatly appreciate you letting me be a part of this. So thank you. Risk.